Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. For this one, we're talking about 80 core server chips that are coming out, Russia's alternative internet, Intel and its LGA 1200 socket likely supporting LGA 11.5X coolers, which would be fantastic to see because there's a lot of those on the market, demand for GDDR6 potentially affecting GPU prices for 2020, and a couple of other news items like Nintendo's PlayStation. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is what we've been using for years to manage our own Gamers Nexus store, and we've been incredibly happy with the choice. Squarespace makes e-commerce easy for those interested in starting stores, but it also has powerful tools to build all types of websites. Photo galleries for photographers, resume and portfolio sites, and small business sites are all easily done through Squarespace. Having built a lot of client websites the old way before running GN full-time, we can easily recommend Squarespace as a powerful, fast solution. Go to squarespace.com slash gamersnexus to get 10% off your first purchase with Squarespace. First up, a quick follow-up before we get into some of the bigger news items. Uh, I'll quickly note that the Disappointment 2019 PC t-shirts are completely sold out, so thank you for buying all of those. We're not restocking them, but we'll probably bring back just the front design without the 2019 dates on the back since it won't be 2019 anymore. But thanks for buying those. We sold out of most sizes within 48 hours. Pretty awesome to see. Cat Angels, though, I wanted to talk about this. We did that charity PC build for a Christmas Day upload. We put one on this channel, and then we put just cat B-roll, 15 minutes of it, on the GN Steve side channel, which you sub should subscribe to if you haven't. And I, I wanted to follow up on it because Cat Angels, if you missed it, it's a, uh, it's a cat shelter, it's a rescue shelter, no kill properly, and they do a lot of great things to support the cats that are there. I went there personally and visited it, and I could tell that all the money that comes in goes straight into the cause, which is great to see as well. So they followed up with us after we did the video and published it. I, I'm not sure that Cat Angels quite fully appreciated the scope of the community when we first met up with them, but now they certainly do. So first of all, viewers contributed over $1,000 to Cat Angels via their donation page on the site, which is amazing. And we're planning to work with you all to do a charity auction coming up, hopefully in the next couple weeks, where we'll also be contributing some more to that, and then we'll be taking whatever the items sell for and contributing that as well. So we'll talk about that shortly in the next couple weeks. Keep your, your eyes open for that, especially if you want to buy some, uh, for example, the original Threadripper reviewer crate we're going to auction off. But anyway, over $1,000 by the community, which is amazing. Our distributor uh, also contributed to that. And then we got a statement from Cat Angels, which said, quote, I want to thank you all so much for your kindness and generosity. The lovely comments from the gaming community are very sweet and heartwarming as well. And I'm going to interrupt the quote here and say, this is maybe the one time that's true. So thanks for making everyone look good, people in the community. <laughs> I think collectively we all appreciate that. We can all go back to bickering over GPUs, CPUs, and Red Dead Redemption 2 and Stadia now. Anyway, continuing the quote, it says, the, uh, the fabulous computer you put together is outstanding. I've never seen anything boot so fast and access the internet this fast. I sort of feel like I should seatbelt myself before I get pulled over. Many thanks to you and the team. And then they also said the donations are steadily coming in from all over the world. Uh, and they said, we are overwhelmed by the kindness your viewers have shown us. Thank you, thank you. This has been the best Christmas ever. So uh, awesome to hear about the community support and separately kind of a, a great reminder on <laughs> just how much SSDs have progressed computing because we've been using SSDs here for so long now that under a minute boot times is it's expected. So to move someone from probably a hard drive that was cluttered and had a bloated OS to an SSD obviously was noticed by them. Anyway, check out the video from the 25th if you want to see more on that. Let's move into the news. Ampere is prepping an 80-core Quicksilver server chip. We've been talking about Ampere computing for probably about maybe six months to a year now. They've been in the news occasionally. Maybe a week or two ago was the most recent. And Ampere computing continues to make appearances in these news recaps because of its advancements in its server chips. So we just recently learned about a workstation featuring Ampere's 32-core EMAG processor. We covered that a week or two ago. And now, thanks to Anantech, we know that Ampere is prepping a new line of server chips. Anantech has aptly called the chips, and I really do like this name, the Anti-Graviton 2. So they're codenamed Quicksilver, but they've called it, Anantech has called it Anti-Graviton 2. The Graviton 2 is Amazon's custom ARM-based solution. It is a 
chip that will be deployed exclusively for the AWS cloud empire that it is now. And like the Graviton 2, Ampere's Quicksilver chip will be based on ARM's Neoverse N1 architecture and core design. And the uh, Graviton 2, though, is expected to top out at 64 cores, and Ampere is going for 80 for the Quicksilver. So per Anantex reporting, Quicksilver will be manufactured on TSMC's 7 nanometer node, exactly which 7 nanometer node we don't know yet. The Quicksilver chip will also be of monolithic design. The N1 cores will be single threaded, and the chip will boast more than 128 PCIe lanes. Ampere wouldn't get into specifics, but we should know more as an official announcement will take place sometime in early 2020. However, an ARM-based chip with over 128 PCIe lanes would be more than any other chip on the market currently, x86, ARM, or otherwise. Quicksilver will also come in with 8-channel memory support, which we're still waiting for SWRX8, which is the STRX40 counterpart that should have 8 channels for Threaded for 3, the 64-core CPU coming out. But for Quicksilver, uh, it's going to support dual socket configurations. It'll use the CCIX protocol over PCIe Gen 4 for comms. TDP will range from 45 watts up to 200 plus watts, depending on how they calculate that number. It could mean a few different things. For 80-core designs at the top of the stack, and then Ampere is expected to enter volume production sometime in first quarter 2020 or in second quarter 2020. So within the first half, we should be hearing about more about that, maybe even at CES in the next couple of weeks, which you should be paying attention to pretty soon. LGA 1200 and the new socket could retain LGA 115 x compatibility for coolers. This is one we talked about recently as well, but the uh, new Z490, as it's currently codenamed chipset from Intel, will be accompanied by a new socket. This is something we talked about a week or two ago, something that we've confirmed with motherboard partners, and this will likely be for what will effectively be the 10900K, not X, unless Intel renames it, and hopefully they do. But uh, that's, that's the current plan for Z490. We don't know exactly when it's supposed to show up, but we've seen them. We've seen the boards. Uh, last time we went to Asia, we saw some. As far as the socket and cooler compatibility, rep, uh, the reputable hardware leaker Momomo underscore US on Twitter, who's been dead on lately, has spotted a drawing for Intel's Lumion LGA 1200 socket destined for Comet Lake chips and their associated motherboards. The LGA 1200 socket is reportedly set to replace the LGA 1151 socket that's been the desktop standard since Skylake. Per Intel's socket naming convention, the LGA 1200 socket should come equipped with 1,200 pins, which would be 49 more than LGA 1151. This gives traction to rumors that Intel has managed to increase the pin count on Comet Lake's LGA by using extra space on the substrate. Also, the dimensions in the drawing appear to be similar to that of the LGA 115X sockets, suggesting that Comet Lake's LGA 1200 socket could retain LGA 115X cooler compatibility. If true, this would help reduce the stain for early Comet Lake adopters having to buy a new motherboard who could save money by recycling their well, don't do that. You can save money by reusing their current CPU cooler, assuming it's capable of handling Comet Lake's increased power consumption anyway. Demand for GDDR6 looks like it might inflate GPU pricing for next year, and this comes from a report by DRAM Exchange, which is one of the best sources for information for memory pricing and NAND pricing, if you're ever curious about any of that. DRAM prices are set to rebound, specifically DRAM for GPUs, and the driving force for the expected price increase is the demand for GDDR6, which we've now seen from both AMD and NVIDIA. And the 5700 XT from AMD has been doing really well, so that certainly helps drive things, although you're splitting orders at that point. Anyway, but GPU makers are continuing to migrate away from G5. Slowly but surely, it'll be phased out for the enthusiast lineup anyway. Might see it in laptops for a while. NVIDIA's RTX line uses G6 exclusively, as does AMD's RX 5000 series so far, uh, or 5700 series anyway. AMD and NVIDIA have also retroactively outfitted older GPUs with GDDR6. Additionally, Sony and Microsoft, which have had a lot of leaks about their consoles lately, will use GDDR6 for their upcoming consoles for the next year. The PS5 and Xbox Series X, or just Xbox or whatever it is, are rumored to be using G6. It's also rumored that the consoles could come with as much as 16 gigabytes of G6, and as such, demand for GDDR6 is expected to outpace supply for 2020. And that condition usually isn't one that favors consumers so much as it does the companies that make the memory. Trendforce expects that the great memory triumvirate, that is Samsung, SK Hynix, and Micron, 
will shift some of their wafer capacity towards G6 as we enter 2020. And as such, we could see bit output for graphics, DRAM, in 2020 exceed 15%. Russia, whose president has his own ideas of what a free and open internet should look like, recently conducted unprecedented tests in unplugging itself from the wider internet, effectively beta testing the country's domestic internet. So RUNet, as it's called, essentially acts as a giant intranet, at least in theory, isolated from the broader internet itself. While details are currently vague, the tests have been deemed successful insofar as Russia's ability to control inbound and outbound traffic. The tests were supposed to simulate a large-scale cyber attack and offer an opportunity for Russia to test its ability to preserve its internal infrastructure. Without knowing more about the tests and what state exactly RUNet is in, it's hard to assess how far Russia has progressed here with its goals of making a domestic internet. Reportedly, in unplugging from the internet, RUNet was able to afford access to local services via DNS cache. However, without a proper alternative to the DNS, Russia's alternative internet is all but non-functional. Uh, Russia currently relies on international connections and resources in order to connect to the wider internet and access it, and replicating those won't be easy or quick. However, reading between the lines here, one could begin to see how this may lead Russia to exerting a greater control over how the internet is used in its country. So Russia has already passed laws requiring all smartphones sold in the country to come pre-installed with Russian software. Uh, Russia is also investing heavily in creating its own Wikipedia. And that said, time will tell whether RUNet will be or won't be uh, a thing that exists. But it's technology, so we'll cover it if it pops up again. Next one, Chuck Peddle, creator of the 6502 microprocessor, sadly passes away. Chuck Peddle, the father of the 6502 chip, passed away recently. Many are unaware of Peddle's contributions to home computing, which is a shame, but we can shed light on some of it. Peddle created the first, quote, cheap processor known as the 6502 microprocessor which powered the first wave of successful home computers in the late 70s, including the Apple II and the Commodore PET. Additionally, 8-bit gaming consoles such as the Atari 2600 and the NES used the 6502 or a variation of that chip's design. Pedal and a team of engineers developed the 6502 at Moss Technology after Motorola refused to allow Pedal and his team to develop it in-house. At the time, Motorola was trying to sell its costly $300 6800 CPU, and it viewed Pedal's vision for a cheaper chip as in-house competition. After moving to MOS Technology, Pedal and his team built the 6502, and it cost $25, or roughly one-sixth the cost of competing designs from Intel and Motorola. In summing up Pedal's legacy as a home computing pioneer, Doug Fairbairn, a director at the Computer History Museum, said it best, quote, Chuck Peddle is one of the great unsung heroes of the personal computer age. Virtually all of the early successful mass market personal computers were built around the 6502, not chips from Intel or anyone else. And as I mention, every time the Computer History Museum comes up, I do like to shout it out. If you're ever in the Mountain View, California area, kind of out near Santa Clara, San Jose, that area, the Computer History Museum is hugely worth the visit. If you can find a couple hours to go over there, they have a lot of cool stuff there, including some of this technology from this, uh, this segment. So we strongly recommend checking it out. We have old videos on the channel doing tours there too. Next one, Nintendo and its PlayStation prototype at auction. Back in the 1990s, Sony and Nintendo collaborated on a disc-based console known as the Super NES CD-ROM system, or the Nintendo PlayStation. Despite the fact that an estimated couple hundred prototypes were made, none have ever been available. However, Terry Diebold, who's been the sole owner of the only known prototype still in existence, is apparently ready to part ways with it. If you're interested in buying this piece of interesting history from gaming, the prototype will be put up for auction, public auction, taking place March 5th to 7th, 2020. And quote, it's the first time this prototype has ever been offered at a public auction before from Heritage Auctions. Uh, consignment director talking to Polygon. So while there's no current estimate on what the prototype could go for, if you're interested in it, reportedly, uh, Diebold has already turned down a $1.2 million offer for the console. So prepare your wallets. Uh, maybe stay off the Steam sales for a little bit. Last, last one for this week, NVIDIA and the RTX 2080 Max-Q Edition being allegedly faster than next-gen consoles. Also, the sky is up, really no surprise here, but it seems NVIDIA is already keen on the idea 
of letting consumers know that its Max-Q variant of the RTX 2080 will be better than the upcoming consoles. Shouldn't really be that super surprising, but products, that was a good pun by accident. Products that are still a full year away do make it look a bit better from Nvidia's angle, but you're still talking about top end consumer graphics versus consoles that are supposed to be more affordable than a laptop with an RTX 2080 would be. In terms of Nvidia's boasting about this, it's, it's kind of hard to tell who exactly this lazy boasting is targeted at. Uh, it's certainly not for enthusiasts who already know the trimmed down RTX 2080 is faster than custom AMD SOC chips, SOCs with Navi graphics. That shouldn't really be surprising. We're still not in possession of all the specs, but the claim appeared on a slide at NVIDIA's GPU Technology Conference, or GTC, in China. They also have one in the US. I believe they have one in Europe as well. The slide belonged to a larger slide deck illustrating NVIDIA's Max-Q GPU stack and the accompanying gaming notebooks that they'll power. The slide reads, RTX 2080 greater than next-gen console. Even considering that Max-Q variants tend to perform well below their fully spec counterparts, it's still far from an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. It's lazy at best, and misleading, and brand diluting at worst. NVIDIA is effectively comparing a $2,000 gaming notebook to maybe $500 consoles. It's not doing itself any favors with the marketing here. That's it for this one. As always, you can check the sources in the show notes document linked in the description below. And going back to the first news item, if you'd like to help out Cat Angels, you can check them out at catangelsnc.org or check our December 25th upload if you'd like to see that or the GN Steve Side channel for just the B-roll from that video. Subscribe for more, go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly, or patreon.com slash gamersnexus to access a couple of the new behind the scenes videos and Patreon only Ask GNs. We'll see you all next time.